Welcome to RHI Sociable City Interviews, where we meet with global thought leaders on nightlife and the social economy. Today, we are here with Mark Klecko, a lieutenant with the Minneapolis Police Department. Starting his career in 1995, Mark has worked most assignments in the Urban Police Department. Mark is proficient in event safety, protest mitigation, and incident command in law enforcement, and is a graduate of the Minnesota Chiefs of Police Association Leadership Academy. Mark holds a master's degree in human services and delivers nationwide DHS approved training courses on risk management. Most importantly, he brings firsthand insights on the evolution of the Minneapolis Police Department since the George Floyd demonstrations, city council defund police policy changes, and recent success in reducing gun violence in the entertainment district. Hey, Mark, it's great to talk to you. Uh, great that you're taking the time uh, to be here today. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jim. I appreciate the opportunity to share some of this information. All right. Well, I'm really uh, interested in knowing your background um, and, and your role right now with the police, particularly, you know, since we're all about nightlife, uh, where you fit into the whole continuum. Certainly. Uh, I've been with the police department in Minneapolis for 28 years. Uh, I'm probably the most versed in, in events that, of anybody that, that currently works for the city of Minneapolis Police Department. Uh, last couple of decades, I've been kind of acutely aware of events and I've been in different roles. I've been a bike cop and a permitting official. And now I currently I'm, I'm uh, the group, one of the group of, uh, I lead the group of management that, that maintains the safety and um, inspires the employees that we put out, the police officers that we put out for emergency service in the downtown area. Uh, we worked in uh, Minneapolis in 2015, and our primary focus was around the warehouse district. And um, uh, it was really an interesting time, a lot of interesting things going on uh, back then. Uh, and, and I know you mentioned before that you were involved in, 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 a, in a bit with the project itself. So how would you say the changes in the warehouse district come, what, what changes have occurred you know, from your perspective, and we'll get into more specifics in terms of the changes in policing, but just more generally, how has that whole area evolved and changed? I will. I would start by being um, by saying that I've read, I've reread that report, and how how what's remarkable is how much has stayed the same, how much, how many of the struggles we still we still have. Uh, things that have changed for the better. We we police it differently. We don't police it with predominant uh, off duty police. That we've kind of moved in the area. The best practice around the country, I believe, is this is working and it's working downtown as well and downtown Minneapolis. And the police that serve this area are all working under the authority of the city, not individual clubs. With a few exceptions, there are still a smattering, but back then it used to be a dozen or 18, 20 that worked for different bars. Nowadays, that's down to about four, maybe five. And then the rest of the personnel are all coming from the city. Well, oh, that's interesting that you bring that up. Um, what are the dynamic changes and how had had the clubs reacted to that? I mean, it seemed like that was a, a key part of their security, but at the same time, you know, it created some potential conflicts of interest. So how do you feel the dynamics have changed with a dedicated officer working for the city versus just like you said, 18 to 20 officers on the street that were essentially working for the venues. It is a different dynamic. Some of the club owners don't really prefer it. I think some of them still hire, and they certainly can hire police officers to stand outside their club and work at uh, the protective bubble that we would call it, that the police officers on bike, horse, squad, walking beats put around the whole district. Works better because the clubs don't always trend at the same moments of time throughout the night. An, an example would be some some of them start emptying their club out at 145, some at two. And we, we watch that on the cameras. We operate that whole system um, with an incident commander on Fridays and Saturday nights with camera operators watching to see how the, the night is pulsing. That allows us to move our personnel uh, around and, and identify uh, vulnerabilities and weaknesses. Definitely see when criminals have shown up to start uh, what we would call uh, victimizing the people who are vulnerable at that time, right around between one and, and three. We we know when the criminals arrive and we'll follow them and, and um, make sure that the, the officers on bikes interrupt their, what we would call finessing. 
the chance for someone to con someone else out of their property belongings, cash apps in their phones. One of our biggest problems. You know, I, I, um, I remember going and, and looking at the fusion center, um, which I think was supported by the, uh, the downtown bid, but it was staffed by police and it, it had multiple cameras. I remember doing a tour with the, uh, inspector and we went different places and on his phone he could activate lighting on a camera in a parking lot or an area if there was suspicion that something was going on there um, it seemed like quite a sophisticated system and i understand uh, this was after 9 11 you were able to get really um, sensitive cameras particularly nighttime cameras and so the visibility seemed quite clear um, and like I mentioned uh, offline before, I, I witnessed uh, just by watching a gang shooting that was was occurring with the camera, and and you could uh, you could see the police response and how quickly they apprehend, uh, <clears throat> apprehended the person. So, uh, tell me more about this kind of technology that seems to be a third eye for police, and it's a way to deploy. Uh, like you said, the bike officers, which I was also pretty impressed with. You, you have a very uh, finely tuned uh, bike officer uh, detail that works at night. And it seems that this camera system with the bike officers is a quick response to any incident, like you were saying. But uh, how, how has this kind of remote fusion center uh, changed or helped with your policing? Great question. Something I enjoy talking about. That fusion center, I think that's what it was called back eight years ago, now is uh, more of a, what best practice would call a real-time crime center. Uh, and it's, it's it's evolved into a much bolder operation with more uh, opportunities to bring in professionals from around the enterprise of the city. So we bring in traffic control agent to monitor the cameras for where cars are parking illegally. And then that traffic control agent is a manager who deploys their resources at the same time that we are also, we put a, a lieutenant in charge of the night and uh, for the lieutenant deploys the resources for the police. And, and then we also, we try to get folks in from code compliance. I think it's called business licensing in this city, but we, we do try to get those folks in. We do believe that they could really push, kind of turn the dial uh, and change to make the, the entire area uh, safer and more in compliance with. So we have sort of a uniform way that these clubs operate and serve the folks that are coming down, the 10, 20,000, maybe even 25,000 people that we see on a nightly Fridays and Saturday nights down in, in this small district in downtown Minneapolis. You know, you, you just raised some really important uh, points. I know in cities that we work with and you were at our summit, you know, I think part of the, the challenges that some cities are facing is you know, there's large groups of, of young adults who come into the downtown, not to patronize the venues, but they take over parking lots and they create parties. And, you know, you have also um, other risk factors. And and um, and so, you know, what, what you just uh, explained to me was that these cameras can actually help traffic and parking who work at night, which is not always typical, be responsive to just you know, it's kind of like the fixing broken windows theory. If if you enforce parking regulations, you're you're demonstrating a, a you know a compliance uh, and civility uh, tone to the to, to the area and the district. Um, and so it it seems like you know you you you're integrating traffic control and parking control into your nighttime management, which is uh, somewhat unusual from our experience. Uh, so, so what made you go in that direction? It really was the infusion of this warehouse district live, an event that was placed in the middle of our district, which had almost as its primary obligation was to cut off traffic. Secondarily was to have a place for people to gather and uh, to enjoy enjoy the night outside uh, and, and do some of the activations that, that they put up. They take a block off of it off of the area and we we get to eliminate three different left-hand turns and then at the same time we get to manage all the traffic 
the traffic control agents came in with that project and uh, we, we uh, asked them over and over, can you please come into our room and we work as a team, finally got that accomplished and it's working better than ever. We have a man named Conrad that sits with me and I ask him, hey, how's it looking on this block? What does this feel like to you? He, he's really the professional when it comes to traffic movement, parking, what, they're, what they can and cannot do. Many folks think the police have that corner on that uh, expertise, how traffic moves and parking regulations and, and all, really not a police skill set in this city anyway. It's not something we, we ticket, monitor, or have you know, unique skills in. So having Conrad next to me and he's able to deploy his personnel, it is working better than we ever imagined. And uh, I'd recommend it for other for other agencies that are struggling with the driving and the parking and these parking lots that that generally, if you leave a parking lot long enough with people in there uh, partying, bringing their own liquor and, and carousing, somebody seems to get shot. It seems like it's always a you can predict it. You just leave it alone for a few hours and somebody will go in there with a gun and shoot someone. It's, it's pretty sad. I was just on another conference call uh, uh, with, with a college town in, uh, in Alabama, Tuscaloosa. And, you know, the chief there, like most chiefs, are just short on officers. There are so many forces that are coming together that police departments, not only in the United States, but around the world, are challenged with recruiting officers in the U.S. In particular, a lot of the focus on policing has made people less incentivized to join the police force. You have an aging uh, population that are retiring. Um, and, you know, uh, Daryl Stevens, who used to be the executive director of Major Cities Chiefs Association, he and his son are doing research at the University of Florida in, uh, um, in, 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 in policing talking about, you know, how to adapt to this challenge. They're looking at integrating uh, security, private security into a, a street management or a public space management role. And what I hear you saying is um, police are not necessarily the best uh, equipped or oriented to traffic control and parking, um, but it seems like you've worked out a system that you've augmented policing to allow your officers to be more dedicated to what they do uh, well um, versus having to take on roles and responsibilities that they're not suited for, which, which gets to this uh, kind of defund police movement and the, the ways in which uh, activists have suggested <clears throat> that there needs to be better ways to deal with people who have mental health issues on the street and ways in which to deal with certain incidents that police, like you said, that's not their primary responsibility or training, um, but they're often given all of these tasks with the expectation that they should be able to do it all. So, so how have things changed in Minneapolis? It seems like you've made a lot of improvements in reallocating resources and really taking what resources exist and, and reformatting them and refining them to where they're more specifically targeting uh, areas where the those involved have more expertise. So, so have, how have you seen kind of this, you know, attention to policing in Minneapolis uh, changing and being restructured and reoriented? Well, as uh, one of the 520 officers left in the city out of a, the city was staffed at 890 prior to, uh, well, three years ago, that's where we were. So as one of those that stick, uh, stayed behind, I've watched all of the changes. And I'm, we, not all of them are positive. Some of them have tried and failed, which I'm a fan of. I believe people should, we should try uh, as much as we can. And some of them will be failures, but many have succeeded. One of them is using outreach workers. We do that at late night as well with DID you've mentioned, our downtown improvement district. Um, they'll hire outreach workers that, you know, t-shirt groups work in a group of four, usually they're there are older uh, men who have more influence in the populations that we struggle with, and they'll go out and they'll be deployed from our room as well, because we have that outreach workers kind of supervisor with us. That's one of the ways that they, we've used police less, just when people are play fighting or carousing, causing trouble, making other people uncomfortable. It's not really something we want to deploy the police into right away. Um, I think many people believe the police should be handling that sort of thing. We just don't have the police to do it. It's not our skill set. 
just like parking. Uh, other other areas that the police have kind of dialed down on or tried to dial down is the, helping folks that are struggling with mental health. Definitely when they're hitting crisis mode and they need emergency mental health, uh, the police uh, back up people called behavioral crisis responders, another civilian group that goes out in a vehicle with a uniform, weaponless folks that that um, use our radios. And then we we listen to them. We can we are concerned about them. Uh, but we'll back them up. They'll back us up. That's a, that's probably one of the best things that Minneapolis has done. One of the fails that Minneapolis is involved in is the use of, well, I think they were originally called violence interrupters. It really hasn't moved in the direction that it was meant to move. I think it's still it's still trying to work that part out, but those folks aren't really hitting the, the center of the, of the dartboard, if you will, at the way some of these other initiatives are. That defund the police movement that you asked about, what, what that's done to those of us that are left is just, it's, it's put this unquenchable thirst in the minds of the folks who want to hire police. Our off time is in more demand. I think some officers are, or all officers are enjoying this sort of very heavy supply side economic element where their time is, and the value of their time is only increasing, going up constantly. Um, mm -hmm. So they're being paid. Um, for their off time at, at, at alarming rates. And that, that's what we're seeing with the defund police movement, although it hasn't really happened in Minneapolis, the defunding hasn't happened. That movement, uh, those people who, who pushed that forward were elected at the time have, have left office and been replaced by um, leaders with different, different uh, motivations. Yeah. So. so it seems like you've, you've adapted. Now, I remember when I was there, there was a group called Mad Dads and I know that these are people who, you know, it came about, uh, I guess it started in um, in Nebraska, um, Omaha, where a, a man's son's new car was vandalized and he was, his son was shot and he was out to retaliate. And the minister said, well, rather than retaliate, why don't you go help some of these gang members? And so that started that... Uh, that movement, uh, particularly of, of former gang members who go out on the street, or at least this was what was happening at the time, and kind of interject with uh, people either on the street or if they've been arrested and they're in jail, try to help them to get a different path in their life. Now, is Mad Dad still a functioning component of the city? It is, and it's it's the longest running. It goes at least 20 years in my memory, uh, just because when I first met V.J. Smith, the founder of the Minneapolis chapter, it was over 20 years ago. It's, it is remarkable how, how they do their work and how they how they attract employees into that mission and the way that they work together as a team. And, and then the, the police work with them. There's, it's very cooperative. Uh, we see each other on scenes quite a bit. In fact, people who uh, right fresh after a murder We've seen them on video being right next to uh, some pretty catastrophic, you know, events, crimes and murders that have happened. And when we get there, they're right there helping us make sure that the crowd um, stays calm and, and helping us uh, with what we need. A lot of times the skill sets we don't have, they have and, and it works. They, they've spawned into a whole bunch of different groups. There's 21 Days of Peace. And we push for peace, different groups, uh, a mother's love. And they're all kind of modeled after the mad dads and the mm -hmm. contract groups that that uh, governments and nonprofits can can contract with to help a certain area sort of recover. And it does take quite a bit off of the needs for the police. Uh, when, when we were in New York, uh, we had a, a speaker, uh, Yvonne Roman, who was the former chief of the Newark Police Department. And she is a co-founder of 30 by 30, which is... Uh, to recognize that women police officers bring a different skill set, like you were talking about, there are certain groups or individuals that bring a different skill set. And she was talking about that happening with police. Then on the panel, where we had all of the uh, women operators, the people who are in the nightlife industry, there was the owner of Yes, um, uh, the club, and she said she has all women security, and she feels that that creates a whole different tenor for how people act and behave. Um, so how would you see, this will be our, our last discussion, how would you see the role of women in policing or women in security um, being an asset uh, uh, as much as anything else? 
I, of all the lessons I learned in New York, attending your conference, this one from Yvonne was was impactful for me. I, I have a, I was a chance, had a chance to meet her afterwards and talk with her about this. And uh, of course, I'm a big proponent of getting th that that accomplished. 30 30 percent of our workforce being women by 2030. That would be wonderful. Uh, we are not close to that now. We do have some women police officers, maybe a hundred uh, total out of the 520 roughly that we have. Uh, I do find women police officers have skill sets that men don't, and and definitely in security organizations as well. We do see that. Uh, I just I think that the criminal element is less apt to act up uh, to to fight with to the people who are um, who, women. Uh, I don't know why, but that's of course there's exceptions, but I think that I've seen that my entire career, 28 years of working now in one service and different different jobs in the police department and i've seen women succeed in areas where men don't of course there's other it goes both ways the skills that both sexes bring to the profession and i think when you're dealing with human interactions and the conflicts that result we do need all, all a, a very diverse group of people to respond to them because we do we complement each other when we all want to get through the event that we've been pushed into and whoever brings the best skill to that particular conflict resolution is the person we kind of push forward. I just interviewed her and, uh, you know, she said uh, there are many op men officers that she worked with that have the same kind of interactive uh, personality. So it's it's not as always been necessarily gender based, but there are social expectations and norms, I think, that move uh, people in different directions. Yeah, I, I really enjoy that concept and, 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 and really want to make Dallas when we go back to Dallas for our next summit a highlight of, of, of women in policing, women in nightlife, women in security, because I think it's just another element that's been lost in the discussion. And I think it really poses a great opportunity in the future. Um, so you already mentioned one lesson that you came back from New York. Anything else that you got? Well, the two big things is that the, the nighttime manager or the nighttime mayor that some of these other cities employ is something I crave. Uh, I'm almost the de facto nighttime manager for the city of Minneapolis's nightlife when I'm working as the incident commander of that operations room, and I know that that's dysfunctional when I'm when I'm dealing with all of the impacts. We shouldn't have a police official doing that. So that's one great lesson we've been trying to really crack that nut here in Minneapolis. It's difficult to change, but I think we'll get that done. And then the other one was this idea that code compliance or our business licensing folks would normalize working at night, especially on weekends when most of the of the clubs who and businesses who would almost accidentally violate their license agreement by having uh, situations that that aren't necessarily in their control uh, could be could be taught how to stay within within compliance and then mm -hmm. within code. Uh, that that's something other cities are doing that we definitely are not and we're, we're pushing toward that as well. I thought that was what was a great lesson. Well, great. Well, I, I'll quote you on that. Um, but uh, anyhow, I want to appreciate your time. And you actually uh, went beyond my expectations of, of clarifying. And I think the various elements of what you just spoke about in just this brief period of time are really great examples and models of how other police departments can adapt to you know a shortage of officers, a response to public concerns about police. And really working with the venue operators to create a safer public space area, which which makes their patrons feel safer and more willing to come out. So this has been a great discussion, and I appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, Jim. Okay, good.